Greetings, everyone. I've been a little out of the loop and glad to be getting back into doing things. Um, my name is Barbara Santangelo da Vignola. I'm based out of the Barony of LC in Anstiara. And I run Barb's Garb as my business at a lot of events, but I also do a lot of research into the garb I make. And I've been, I, been trying to get it out to people so they can make their own as they want. So, hoopalons. They are pretty much the last of the universal clothing in Europe. By the time you hit the mid, mid 15th century, it's starting to get regionalized. But prior to that, starting in the end of the 14th century, you start seeing the hoopalond, the basically the big gown. And it also appears with um, the Code RD quite a bit. Um, the, there should be a link there in chat for the handout. Is that visible to people? If they join the chat late, they will not see previous chat information. So the handouts on Onsteora under files on Facebook. Let me see if I can load it up one more time. Or you may want to wait a little while. Okay. I'll do it right before I start do working through the pictures. Yeah. Because anybody who joins after, when they join, they can't see anything previously posted on chat. Oh, yeah. I tend to forget that, but yes. All right, so the hoopalond was a very loose overgown. It would be worn over a code RD or worn in place of the code RD, either one. The very earliest art I could find of hoopalons is out of Italy and they appear to be unlined silk. And that is a bit of a rarity when you're looking at the hoopalon. As they get, move into the colder countries, they start completely lining them with fur. Obviously, we can't do that now. We would die. <laughs> but you can see from the way they're built that the fur comes out at the neck, fur comes out at the wrist, and fur shows at their dags or their turned hem. And the, the way it hangs shows that it is fully lined in fur. But uh, the style evolved over time. The earliest ones you tend to see with a very high collar, very high closed collar. And they're not quite as full and as elaborate as you start seeing in the beginning of the next century especially with the ones in the Duke de Berry manuscripts. Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to subdivide what I'm reading here. Um, the noble classes used it and it was a sign of what they called conspicuous consumption, showing off. See, I can afford to buy 50 extra L's of this fabric that you can't get because you can't afford it. And it was a way of showing that their social status. And there's often extra pleading. There's the long trailing angel weaves. It gets pretty extensive. The most excessive of the hoopalons we're almost downright ridiculous looking. If you look at them now, you're going, how can you wear all that and still move? But the regular everyday hoopalond was not really that much more tame, but it was a little more realistic of being able to live your life in it. Um,
It says, as easy as it is to assume, assume that fabric is better, that more fabric is better when it comes to hoopalons, nothing made life more difficult was likely to be too popular. So the opulent excessive gowns were most uh, practical for women or for men when they were doing weddings, major social gatherings, stuff where they weren't working. The three basic types of hoopalons, and this is not definitive, this does overlap through time periods, but this is the best I could figure out for how they divided them. You start out with the high necked and fairly tame sleeves in the end of the 14th century. Then you end up with the collared ones that have a, they have a collar that looks like the high neck collar, just undone and turned out. You'll see the points of it on a lot of the pictures. And that's where you like, often see the fur lining it. Um, those were often paired with the angel sleeves, which are the big, long, drapey sleeves that they often dagged. There was also a V-necked one combined with the same sleeves, where instead of turning out the collar, they just simply cut it, which would use less fabric and less lining. And then that one shows up in about the 1420s, in, sorry, 1430s. And the last of them ends up being with the V-neck straight, V-necked with straighter sleeves, more, more tame sleeves by the 1430s. But they interchange, they mix and match. A hoopalon can basically be pick a collar, pick a sleeve, put it all together. And it's fairly correct for almost any time period. One basic rule of thumb is the long trailing angel sleeves belong to the noble classes or the merchant class because they could afford them and they could wear them and have places to wear them that they could just dress up and they didn't have to do work in them. Did they have sumptuary laws about that? There are some, but it's different by every area. And I haven't dug into that as deeply as I could. At that point, a lot of it, though, was simply by what can you afford? How much money do you have? How much money do you have to waste on a piece of clothing? Mm -hmm. And that basically took care of the sumptuary laws because very few people could afford to do that. So I, I make the gowns from the very more, most formal versions down to very basic versions. And there are beautiful gowns in both categories. Fabrics that were used. Very early on, the Italians used silk. And you can tell by the way it drapes. Let me go ahead and put that link back up for the, for the handout. And we can start looking at pictures because it's easiest to describe if we were flipping through the pictures. Loading. All right, should be back up in chat again. All right, if, you'll go, if you wanna flip your thing, it has a heading of 14th century hoopalons. And yes, I'm using a background, so things kind of, slip in and out. Um, the very first page, they're all from Italy. Milan is guessed on the first two. I don't have any real idea on the second one, second set. But you can see in that first picture, there's a, little, a gal in a cream dress. You can tell by the way it's pooling at her feet 
in the lines that it is out of silk rather than a lined fabric of another sort. And she's got the high neck and very tame sleeves. They're probably only a little wider than these fitted sleeves I'm wearing. And you can see a similar gown in the second picture that has the stripes running across it. Those are the earliest ones. You'll see the men in something similar with a little bit looser sleeve. And you also see in that very first picture, basically every class of men. The young page wearing the thing that barely covers his butt. The middle-aged, uh, middle-class gentleman who's wearing one that comes down almost to his knees. And then the older gentleman who would probably be a little bit wealthier, higher status is wearing the one that comes down to his ankles. You don't see that with women. Women's are all long, but with men, you'll see them ranging from butt length to floor length. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder if they should have been wearing what they were wearing. Okay, so through here, you can see it's a mix match. You see the coder D mixed in quite a bit on the Aesop's Fables pictures, th pictures three and four there. And the men's sleeves are getting more crazy, more open, bigger. Um, at the very end of the 14th century, you're seeing like in the, in picture five, You've got the guy standing at the door with all the pleats. And there's been arguments over the years and there's no extant versions to look at as to whether those pleats were actually sewn or if they spent hours twiddling with them with their belt. I, I lean towards sewn because you cannot keep them straight otherwise. But you start getting into the more iconic pictures once you hit the very, very end of the 14th century, one of the very first Duke de Berry manuscripts starts showing the elaborate, actually, let me see about sharing my screen. That'll make this easier. Um, rather than me trying to show it here. Okay, so let me scroll, get my mouse back on the right page. All right, so you've got the Duke de Berry and he's got this bright pink one that the one guy is wearing with the white dags, not quite floor length. He can still walk around in it. And this black one is a much more modest cut it's not as wide cut. It's a it's a thinner width, and the sleeves are much simpler. But they are of the starting to show the sumptuous fabrics that you'll start seeing in a lot of these gowns. You hit the 14th or the 15th century, and you start seeing them in almost every location. They're everywhere. But you also start seeing that they're almost all fur lined. Let me do this. There we go. So you can see that the fur, the gray fur on the one on the left, and then there's a gold fur on the one on the right. But this is where you can start seeing that they're lining the holding thing. She's got the fur at the neck fur in the opening of her dress and the fur at the bottom. And the only way to get that to work properly is to do a full lining. It had to be extremely supple fur, squirrel, weasel. My brain is dropping the names of the correct terms, ermine. 
but the really soft furs, which meant they had to spend hours sewing them all together, which is the other part of these outfits is they took hours and hours to make. But these early ones, you still see that very high neck. It, it comes up right up to the chin. And at that point in time, it was considered appropriate to cover everything. My next pictures in time in period are for actually from, I want to say Milan, I believe. You see a couple of gentlemen here and they are also fur lined, but a pair of knee length, fairly ornate on the one hand, hoopalons. And please chime in with questions at any point if you have them. Um, variants on hoopalons. This just, I work through basically the evolution of how they show up here. So you've got this, the one on the left, she's obviously wearing false sleeves because you can see the bit of her chemise under the at the shoulder there and then loose sleeves on the hoopalon but you can tell it's a hoopalon because of how much fabric is pulled into that waistband men's hoopalons from the early period were a little harder to find in art but i've found a few the one on the right his hat is something else but he's wearing a very serviceable fur lined hoopalon that the fur is actually extended at the bottom. Um, you can have a couple of men in very varieties of hoopalons there. Going to picture 14A, 14A and B. These ones are out of, oh, my brain just keeps dropping the Italian cities. Um, I think Pisa is where it's out of, but that one is Siena. Siena, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but these are elaborate outfits of the day. These are the peacocks of their day. The one guy's well, they're both wearing mismatched boots, which was apparently the thing. But the amount of fabric, I actually tried to make one of these for my husband and you need a minimum of 12 yards of 40 inch fabric minimum i ended up having to do more of a straight sleeve for him because i didn't have 12 yards <laughs> and then very famous one but you can tell he's wearing the uh sleeveless hoop blonde here is lorenzo de medici so those are the ones that appear in Italy. I've separated these out by areas. You want the really elaborate ones? This is where we go. 15th century France. Duke de Berry, all of his, all the books that were given to Duke de Berry are incredibly rich in images of the Hoopalonde. in bright colors, in intricate patterns, you start seeing the brocades appearing more commonly in the French very, very early. But you also see what would be a woolen, a basic woolen outer for them as well. A couple of reasons that uh, we've, it was figured that it must be wool is Dagging holds up better in wool than it does in any other fabric. If you have a good felted wool fabric, you can dag the heck out of it and it doesn't ravel. And most of the other ones don't. The You won't see as much dagging on the brocaded ones simply because they're more ravelly fabrics. They did it, but not as much. So wealth of pictures from the duke de berry many versions and you see side by side the fancy coder d's paired with the fancy hoopalons they were uh at the same time period they they were worn together a lot you've got pictures from 
Chris, Christine de Pizan is always shown in a hoop -alant. typically blue and white. Not always, but very typically. And even in books that were written about her rather than by her. But this is where you're starting to see that turned out collar. You can, you can see on the right hand one here that her collar seems to just simply be opened out. And you can see the fur lining it there. This one as well on the left here. This one is an elaborate drawing of one no one could ever function in. It's pretty. You think but, some of those, do you think some of those are artistic license? Oh, that one is definitely artistic license. You couldn't walk in that. You'd be tripping every three seconds. Some I'm of them are artistic sure. license. Sorry? Um, I'm not sure, actually, because um, there are so many that are depicted like that. Wouldn't they just hold up the skirts? And she is the, a noble woman. So would, wouldn't they be the most typical to wear extravagant lengths? They would, but this one goes beyond any that you see in, mo in other artwork. There is probably a good two feet of fabric on the floor there, and her or her dag sleeves probably go nearly six feet behind her. I think that one is a little bit of extra license. The one on the left is much more real, realistic on how they wore them and how you see them most of the time. They may have draped to the floor, but they rarely trailed, especially the sleeves. You've got more French pictures. What's fun with this one is you see that the back of the neck on the men's is not a straight cut, which is how most people make it. It's actually V cut. And you see it lined with fur there. On the right, you see another one where the neck seems to be turned out. And this one seems to be more a typical loose gown pulled in by a high belt. Not necessarily a pre-pleated item. You've got lady on the, the ladies on the back are wearing the turned out neck of the hoopalons. They're in solid colors with very modest sleeves. They were not quite as high a level of, of noble. They may have been lower level nobles or higher level, uh, probably lower level nobles because they're hunting. But, but there are so, such a rich pictorial history of the gowns, it's incredible. But what you do see is you're starting to see this V-neck coming out. And it's going to become very important in the French style very quickly as it shifts from the Hoopalond over to the more, like this picture, you're starting to see very much the cut that you see a little bit later for the Burgundian gown. It's definitely still a Hoopalond, but it's moving very much to the Burgundian there. There's a couple of men's cut to well below the knee, almost to the floor on those guys. The garden scene, the, Ro the Roman de la Rose art in general will often show them either fully in hoopalons or in hoopalons and coder deeds. But here you see the back cut of, the, of these particular almost Burgundians is cut with kind of a tail down the back. You don't get to see the backs of very many of them, but this is the definite shift to the Burgundian gown. As you move on, you start seeing, she's got her gown. I don't know if you can see my uh, my cursor. Is that showing on yes. screen? Yes. Okay. Um, 
this lady here definitely shows a turned out gown. Whereas this one looks like it is cut to that V-neck. If you can see the difference there. So it's still in transition. You get some semi-round necks you get some very V-necks at this transition period. This was a photo I was so thrilled to find. These were statues put on Isabella de Bourbon's tomb that they got pictures of. But you see Burgundians here, you see full hoopalons here, you can see how the men's like to cut, how the men like to cut their their hoopalons or simple simple over robes as well. But some details from them. He's got one that is cut up the front for ease of walking, despite the fact that it's extremely long. Whereas his has the more more pleated work, and I. It looks like that is the fur that they tend to line the dagging with there at the bottom. But you can see details of the types of belts they wore. Men distinctly wore the belt much lower than women, sometimes so low you wonder how it stays on their hips. This is a picture that I would kill to get a better photo of, but I can't find it anywhere. Can't find it in color, can't find it bigger. It just happens to be in one of the books. I use, but it's got different stages of hoopalons for how fancy they are for the different people. That is in, I don't know, can you see my picture on the side at all? I'll show this book again later, but it's out of the Margaret Scott History of Dress book for the late Gothic. And I think I have that in the bibliography. Okay, so we're getting into variants on the hoopalant. The later you go, you start getting variants. People start doing strange things with them or just doing something completely different. This gal here on the left has the turned out high collar, but she's got it split completely down the front from the looks of it, and she's wearing bells on her belt. Not a very typical layout. The men kept theirs fur lined with heavier fur than the women did in general, probably because they spent more time out of doors. But the, to the tops of these will show you how much fabric goes into them. That's the main reason these pictures are in here. You can tell his are more modest sleeves. The Arnolfini is another one where this is definitely her wedding dress. It is sumptuous. It has, it's not, they don't have dagging. They have some kind of rucking stuff across her sleeves, but it's very decorative. And then just some other reference photos. They're great references also for the crazy hairstyles they, they did. She's got the most ruffle headdress veil that I've ever seen. It's like three solid inches of tiny ruffles. So 14, 1440s, you can tell it's, it's shifting. You've got the, this one has an almost flat neck it's not as wide as the Burgundians, but it's cut like the Burgundians with the V-neck, but she still has those big, huge, wide sleeves. This, the goldsmith shop one from Petrus is one of the first ones that you see the more modest sleeves on the women again. She's wearing extremely expensive gold fabric, yet she's got a very modest sleeve on it. And rather than fur, she has her lining with silk. Whereas her husband in that picture has the fur lined hoopalant. Men started splitting them down the front 
by about 1440. You'll see some like the guy in red, the goldsmith, has his as a full coat. The other guy has it as a more of an overcoat. But you can see that split down the front in these ones as well. And then you see the ladies in waiting in, they have silk instead of fur on their gowns or else they have dyed fur. I really am not sure, but I suspect it's more silk or wool than fur. A couple more reference pieces. That one's great for the, how the guise is put together. You're starting to see the distinct Burgundian gown here. The men are still wearing houppelons, but the women's have shifted in France. This portrait on the right here is wonderful because it shows the anatomy of the belt. It is probably the only one that shows the actual anatomy of the belt of the Hoopalon or of the Burgundian. It's fairly wide. You can see, uh, I want to say armor and castings out of Europe somewhere makes a replica of it. It's over $100 to get it from them, so I don't carry it. But you can purchase that replica of that belt buckle from them. Here's a couple of younger girls. You can see that they have the, the same type of gown. And I don't even go to the headpieces. Those are, there's a lot of people with different opinions on how those headdresses work. So some of these I have in here as much to see, like this one, this necklace. You can see what kind of, a really detailed of what kind of necklace they wore, more of a collar that they wore with these. You've got this one where there's a very wide set Burgundian in the front with more traditional ones in the back. And this one, she's in cloth of gold with the red silk on it. These two pictures I have in here because you start seeing the younger girls' dresses changing very much. And it's very distinct, the lace down the front. These two are the same cut. The difference is this one has trim lining the opening. Not all the way down, but has has it lining the opening. You start seeing the girls, what the girls are gonna be wearing changing from miniature versions of what the women are wearing. You see that under, or that girl's dress here again. And you see a more traditional, very simple colored uh, Burgundian there. More just reference photos. This has scads of reference photos. Okay, moving to English. English, we're not always up with the times. They start showing them a fair amount later. This one on the left is very typical of what the women were wearing in 1411, 1412 in France. But in this case, it's the king wearing it. And you see him, there are many versions of this portrait, but some of them show that he, the over, over, sorry, over gown that's pleated better than others. And that's another variant of it. So it's pleated and it's got fur strips running into it. It's an elaborate beastie. So this one is from a tapestry. Sometimes that's your best location for art. You've got the probably silk patterned hoopalon on the right that's long for the lady, the short one just to the knee for the man. The men are wearing bag sleeves in this one. She's wearing what would be called the angel sleeve. There is a more modest version of it shown in a lot of paintings. 
the sleeves are not the crazy open ones that you cannot work in. Theirs is a much more modest variant. The men's overcoats for fancy occasions were elaborate. Women's were tamer than they are elsewhere. She's got that straight sleeve going there instead of the angel sleeve. Okay, let's see what else we got here. So more reference photos. If you're trying to do an area specific hoopla, these photos would are your best resource. Photos, pictures, art, whatever it is. Um, there's some men's ones. Men's art is not always the easiest to find. You've got the women's dress by 1476 is changing pretty thoroughly in, in England. It's on its way to becoming the Tudor gown. But the men are still distinctly wearing hoopalons. I couldn't resist this one. She's in a later period hoopalon with the rounder neck. Coconut, whoever's sleeping over there. You've got the king in an open front hoop aland. Uh, his pages and the other people are wearing shorter to longer ones. And this is one of the last pictures I find of the big sleeves. And they're not that big. And it's from one of the manuscripts. So they're going to do a little bit more than they do otherwise. Okay, that is the survey of pictures. Hopefully you can have take time and go through it more, more serious. There are two main um, what do you call them? Theories on how they were built. And that might be different for the different time periods. So a lot of mine are going to be built with this. You've just got the standard sloped shoulder. And from the, you, you rotate the armpit, you actually rotate it out a little bit so it's running down the angle. But then you angle it out for however big you want the skirt. Um, he shows how to make a couple of the sleeves. The sleeves go on very simply. They don't have major rounded heads yet. There's his shorter version with a more moderate sleeve, and he shows you how to slit it if you want the slit that you see in some of them where they can reach their undersleeves out and leave the sleeve where it was hanging. It makes for a slightly narrower hoopalond. It fits more to the upper body. This one is hard to explain, but what is happening let me actually, I will, I'm going to go out of that. What is happening with it to create all the pleating is instead of a straight seam like we are doing with most, you take and invert it. So the wider fabric is forced to pleat in when it lays flat. So it actually for, forms an upwards curve at the shoulder, which then lays down. If you make it that way, you absolutely have to hang it out for a few days before you hem it, or your hem will look really weird. It does allow for a lot more fabric in the dress itself. And it allows for it to pleat properly down to the waist. And the best way I could put it in here was to I contacted her, she said, have fun. I put her uh, Cynthia Virtues from her website, how to do it up. So those are the ones, oh, sorry, I went off share screen and now I'm pointing at my screen, that's helpful. Those are the ones that have been made with that pattern. And you can see that they do hang nicely. Um, let me see. This is not rotating. There we go. 
So below it, I have a couple of different basic sleeve ideas. Bag sleeves, you'll want to read through uh, Cynthia's website. You can find it, just search Cynthia Virtue and Hoopalond and you'll find it. She'll talk about a different way to build the bag sleeve that works better than the picture here, but that gives you the general idea of how it's, how it's gonna hang. You've got your angel wing, you've got your trumpet wing, trumpet sleeve. This picture is wonderful for when you're working with uh, Burgundians, because you see that it is actually a panel pinned to her underdress that's underneath it. They didn't actually wear underdress and another dress and then the Burgundian over it. They pinned that panel in. There are several patterns out there. And of them, the best commercial pattern for these is the period patterns. Do not get the Rocking Horse Farms pattern. It is horrible. It has some really wonky things going on with it. But then the rest of the art is just to show how the backs were constructed on a lot of these. Um, go ahead, look through art and stuff. And it looks like I did not put the books on here. So let me do that. Let me show you the books that I've been working with. Come on. There we go. Coming. Okay. History of Dress, Late Gothic Europe, Margaret Scott. It's not easy to find, but it's a fabulous resource. Oops, keep it close to me. So, History of Dress series from Margaret Scott for the Late Gothic is 1400 to 1500, covers these gowns. If you're more interested in period construction techniques, Textiles and clothing from, from 1150 to 1450 covers a lot of these and tells you how they were built in the sense of extant pieces they found and how they edged them and all that kind of stuff. It goes into a lot of detail, deals with mostly extant pieces. So some of these, the information carries over, but they don't have very many extant hoopalons. They were cut up for other things later for the most part. And then just a very, very, very rich book to look through are the Duke de Berry books. You just flip it open and you get, ah, there, hold it there. You get all kinds of hoopalon pictures. Okay, sorry, using a background and it plays with it. So those are the books and the reference photos I've used. I have some on hand that I've been making because I've been having fun with the fabrics. And I'll just walk you through what I've done with them. Okay. So this is a ladies. It is fairly full, but it is fitted at the shoulders. It has a moderately high neck. I cheat and just put a strip of fur in there. It is not fur lined all the way. We would die of heat, but there's a little strip of the softest uh, squirrel fur there. And it's a modest sleeve with fur at the end. This is one of the less expensive Sartor fabrics, just as a note. Sartor is one of the reproduction fabric companies that makes fabrics from period. So. That's one of them I've made. To change styles, the upper closed neck with a modest angel sleeve. Just, I buttonholed two holes to be able to put that, the brooch through it, but you've got your just basic fold over collar and you've got a modified, it's somewhere between a trumpet and a and an angel sleeve, but it's a modest sleeve. This is out of a more standard brocade. It's not as heavy as a lot of the upholstery brocades, so it'd be considered a very light upholstery brocade. 
but those also hang fairly quite well when you start belting them up. The next one I had fun making was a takeoff on the Christine de, de Pizan gowns. This one's a little bit big for the hanger, it doesn't like to stay put. It's got the turned out collar. I may go back later and line the collar. I have not done that. But you've got the, the long sleeves with the dagging with the white lining. So there's another way of putting it together. So when they would wear these, then they would show pleating because of the way they're belted? Yes. Here, let me see if I can falsify how it looks. <laughs> This is definitely not the right belt for it. The more plain the dress, usually the more elaborate the belt, just as a note. But when you wear it, it pleats in. Does that make sense? Right. So if they had a lot of fabric, would they go in and I guess have their attendants put all the pleats in in a very formal way? Most likely if they're basically, if they're being just shown off, they're going to have you sit on and go meet, 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 meet. Very nicely ordered. Yes. So I have to show the next couple just because they are so gorgeous. <laughs> Shiny. This is, one of, this is one of the Sartor more expensive fabrics. It's got the more modest sleeve and it's very period because the sleeve is pieced. They did a lot of that. I was running low on fabric and had to make the sleeves work. But it's got a, about a two inch stand up collar. They can wear it, wear it turned out or they can wear it closed. I include the fur if they wanna put the fur at the neck, but I don't do it. <laughs> But this one has all my all my fur is repurposed from old old shawls and old coats and this one has a has mink and it also has mink there at the bottom so that would if they add the mink right here at the neckline it will give the impression that it's fully lined but that's one of their fun fabrics and the last one i have I have the intention of dagging. I just haven't had the nerve to do it yet. Because fabric scares me <laughs> to start doing that kind of work with it. But it's got a bag sleeve with the fur lining. But once again, it has that stand up collar. This one's actually a little wider than the other one. So if you really want to look a thousand like a thousand dollars, you buy some of the Sartor fabrics when they come available. They don't have very many available right now. I have a stash that I have to work through. <laughs> so that gives you an idea. Are these washable? These ones, I recommend dry cleaning if you're going to wash them. Yeah. I don't even dare because the that last one I showed you and the one before it. Those are gold wrapped threads, mm. gold wrapped threads. I'm not going to put that through the washer. Mm -mm. So they have their fabrics, the Sartors, they have guys in Thailand sitting on little looms, the little 36 inch wide looms hand, hand making this fabric. So when that's why they always have a limited supply. <laughs> you also run into the very period thing of you cut two pieces, they don't always line up. So you line it up at the most obvious spot and let it work its way out. But the, I also make them out of linen for modern day. Yeah, it's a lot warmer than it was back then. Something to keep in mind with these when you're looking at the pictures. They lived in the little ice age. It was cold. Everything was lined. Ah, um, oh, 
I need to go over there. The highly decorative fabrics is from Sartor. If you search Sartor, you can get it. There's also, let me put another name in there. Is this is another source for some historical fabrics. Those are both based out of Europe. They both have period fabrics done from extant pieces. So fabulous fabrics. But expect to pay for the nicer ones upwards of 50 to $70 a meter. Questions? Anybody? Yes. So with so much variation in the styling, what, what makes you call something a hoopland? When is it a hoopland and not, I don't know. An, like a code RD or the other. Code RDs are fitted. I'm trying to get to where it's not doing weird stuff with my picture. Fitted from here to the hips. It's very fitted through here. What makes a hoopalond a hoopalond is that it goes from here out and then is belted in. That's what designates a hoopalond. That's different from, say, the code RDs. Code RDs are going to be fitted through the body. Hoopalons are rarely fitted unless they're fitted through just the upper body. But then it flares. Any other question? Did I answer it thoroughly? <laughs> Well, part of what I was thinking was like when you talk about a Burgundian, is yes. the difference between a Burgundian and and or a Tudor gown is that in the neckline, um, because they're still pretty huge, right? Pretty unfitted. Yeah, Tudor gowns you're running into are moving more towards an Elizabethan for the most part. Their bodice is completely changing; it's becoming a two-piece item. But with the Burgundian, what's happening is you still cut the fabric out at an angle. The only difference is your neckline. Okay. So it still qualifies as a type of hoopalond because of that. Whereas the Tudor gowns are very fitted through the upper body and then they have right. the bigger skirts. Okay, thanks. The red and gold fabric on the last one you showed, was that um, also a Sartor fabric and from how long ago? I got this fabric probably three Pensix back. So it's no longer available. So they sell things only at Pensic, and if you don't make it to Pensic, it never makes it on their website? No, it's always on their website. I don't but recognize the one. That's why I was wondering. They don't have very many up right now got because it. they do their big sales through Gulf Wars and Pensic. Okay, thank you. They also do have a large following in Europe, which is why they have to still put them on their websites. They have a lot of fabrics. If you want a mid price fabric, you get something like the blue and gold I showed you. This one is not, oh, there's a pin in that one and it got me. <laughs> this fabric is a Lucchese-ish pattern. It is not a pulled from an extant piece. It is inspired by them looking at a bunch of different extant fabrics and going, this pattern would have fit. But they don't charge as much for it because it's not documentable. Does that make some sense? Um, okay, question of, are you happy with the look of the linen ones you've made? Yes. I don't use lightweight linen. And I typically line what needs to be lined. I usually don't line the skirt because there's just enough fabric already to weight it down. I do line sleeves. Especially when I'm doing something like the red one I showed you earlier where I've, I'm doing the dagging and you want that contrast. I've never had a problem with making them, with the way I cut them hanging right on a person. So I, but I also don't do the one set 
use fabric that's five times as wide as me when I cut them. Because most often I'm working with at the max 48 to 50 inch fabric. So they're going to be a little bit more uh, modest on how wide they are. But that's something you do see with the with the brocades is that they're not the wide elaborate ones. You see that mostly in the wool ones and whatever solid fabrics they're using tend to be the wider wider cut ones. Questions? <laughs> Anything else? I tend to always run overtime on this class, so that's why I asked for more time. What what uh, undergarments would you be wearing with this, like a chemise or a basic, a basic chemise? If you're That's wanting it. to wear all all the period layers, if you want all your period layers, you're wearing a basic white chemise. You're wearing a coterie that's very fitted, and then you put this on over it. Okay, since we are talking ice that's, age. Yes, they wore as much as they could put on. And still look good. Okay. But um, I've been doing the hoopalons off and on for about ten years now, and I always, I often learn stuff from my students as much as I teach it. So my handout usually is always of evolving. So if I offer the class again, it may have new stuff in it. Just as, just as a note, it's, it hasn't evolved for, well, since the start of pandemic, but before that it was, it was evolving. Questions on fabrics, on cut, on anything. Um, I think I missed this because I was trying to deal with the uh, crying hunger baby, but um, for the more fitted version, approximately how much fabric are you going to need if you're going to make kind of a more modest looking type of one? The first, did you see the first green one I showed? I when, did not. I was okay, let me show it. with the little monster. No, that's fine. That's fine. Let me pull it back out. So this one. I managed to eke out of seven meters of fabric. Okay. It's got them, it's a more modest cut. It's got the straight sleeves, but I eked it out of, out of seven meters. You really, especially if you're working with the 40 inch wide fabric, need at least eight meters to make one of these realistically. Meters have, or yards? With Sartor fabric, I'm working with meters. Okay that's how they sell it but i would say you want eight eight and a half yards of okay. fabric awesome i Thank missed you. the width on that the width of the fabric so i'm this, sorry oh the width of the fabric is the fabrics i get out of sartor are usually between 36 and 45. okay um i have a fabric question as well um, I have a really pretty um, printed cotton, mm -hmm. but it's just a cotton broadcloth. Could I line that well enough to make it hang for a gown like this? You probably could. There's also a few kind of modernized techniques that I use depending on the outfit. Some of these, the lighter fabrics, have coins so sewn in coins or washers sewn into the hem to make them hang better but when the i'm pleats, working with lighter weight fabric. i'm worried that the pleats would wouldn't look right you know because they're not going to fold in that heavy way broadcloth might be heavy enough to do it but if i did it i would probably fully line it which means basically cutting two pieces and making them as one garment. Well, that's what I was thinking that maybe if I lined it with linen um, to make it essentially a heavier fabric. You um, will want to tack it in places so it does hang as a pair instead of as two separate items. Oh, that makes that sense. Makes so 
do it in places where it's not obvious or like in the middle of a pattern. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thread's not obvious, but you just tack it here and there enough so that it does hang as one piece. And that that's the main thing with a full lining is they have to be put together in a way that they actually form one piece. That makes sense. So it's not just a two separate pieces of cloth attached at the edges. Yeah, yeah. And if, a, if they're separate cloths, there's a potential that once they're hanging, one of them will stretch a little longer and then you may have to adjust your tacks. Yeah. yeah. There's that. Definitely one thing I do always do with hoopalons before I hem them, I hang them from anywhere from overnight to a couple of weeks before I touch the hem. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it may hang weird. <laughs> Are the brocades that you showed us, the red and the blue, are they made completely 100% from silk? The red one is 50% silk. I think the weft is silk. The warp is vis viscous, something that is a natural base. And then it has the gold wrapped threads. So, mm -hmm. And those are silk threads that are wrapped. So it's like 70% silk. You can get 100% silks. They are more expensive than I'm willing to pay. Viscose mm -hmm. is a rayon, so it's it's a wood pulp basically. Um, so it, it's a natural-ish fabric. Well, so many of the brocades I've seen are very shiny and they look like, I don't know, the costume brocade look rather than medieval. Yeah. And some of the cheaper brocades, you'll get that. Theirs don't, I mean, it's not showing well across Zoom. It's just the nature of the beast. Now, they did use loud fabrics. Okay. And it's always surprising to find those extant pieces that are loud fabrics. Hmm. Blue and red and gold. And <laughs> but um, these ones aren't the shine of a cheap fabric. They're the shine of silk, if that makes any sense. Yes, it makes okay, sense. Okay, somebody, somebody's asking what types of belts do I prefer? I use almost exclusively leather belts with these. Softer belts stretch too much. If you have a really tight weave, it probably will be fine. For the basic ones, I don't have anything here, but for the hoopalons before you get into the Burgundians, you want no more than like an inch and a half wide belt. This one, too wide. And if you're using a plain fabric, you want to have the little belt units put on that, on that belt they would stud their belts like you wouldn't believe. But as far as I can tell, it just was a belt that they belted up behind them. I cannot find a back picture of any lady to see how the back of the belt works. Because they don't show it, they just show a nice little line. So they're putting the belt right under kind of um here, as they used to call it. Yeah, right right under the here. Dress line. How do they keep the darn thing up? and not falling down to their waist. With the amount of fabric you're pulling in, it's got something to hold it. Okay. I've never had a problem with my belt falling in one of those. But yeah, primarily, uh, primarily leather. Once you start getting into the Burgundians, you start seeing tight woven belts. Some of those belts, if you get a really good picture on the Burgundians of the portraits, you can see the weave on the belt. But they're dealing with belts that are this wide. And those ones tend to be plain. Once you get into the Burgundians, they're definitely plain belts. Anything else?
All right, I guess we will call it a class. Um, I believe my email.